Today, we're going to be trying something a little bit different to usual. Now, normally I do these style of presentations on a whiteboard or something like that, but I thought I'd mix up a bit and see what I can do about doing all the drawings and animations on the computer screen so they're a little bit clearer. Now, what we're covering today is a type of suspension that's often used on the rear of front wheel drive cars that's known as torsion beam or twist beam rear suspension. Uh, don't confuse it with torsion bar suspension, which is something else again. Now this was a video request from one of my Patreon supporters. If you like what I'm doing here, you can go over and support me on Patreon. Uh, but let's get down to the fundamentals of what this suspension is, how it works, and why manufacturers use it. Now the first thing is, what is this twist beam rear suspension? Well, it's a very simple type of rear suspension that was previously used very widely across front wheel drive cars and now is still present on quite a few different ones. So let's have a look at how this twist beam suspension works. So if you imagine on our front wheel drive car, we have our two rear wheels we're viewing from the top here. And let's say we want to run something like a trailing arm suspension on the car. Um, so what we'll do is we'll have two mounting points on the chassis and then we'll have a trailing arm out to the suspension and the wheel will mount on that. And then we'll do the same thing on the other side. The problem is, is that when we have our force uh, in say cornering or something like that, get applied from the side, uh, you can see that this is not going to be very strong in any sort of uh, deflection. Uh, combined with that, you can see with this setup, we have no sort of roll stiffness. Uh, so we need some sort of anti-roll bar. So what we do is we basically put a beam between here and here. And this beam, uh, it provides a degree of stiffness in roll, so when one wheel goes up, the beam has to be deflected, uh, so it transfers some of the load to the other wheel and you get the stiffness in roll. Um, and the other thing it does is that it provides a degree of resistance against that side force because you can see that we have a torque around here and we can get some stiffness in there as opposed to putting it entirely and bending through this bushing, which if we assume a spherical bushing means we could just pivot the wheel around it. This beam typically has a relatively low torsional stiffness compared to its bending stiffness because it has to be able to resist any vertical forces that turn into moments on the wheels. Because our pivot's at the front there, we can see that the wheel's gonna try and pivot, so we have to resist that in bending to stop the entire assembly sort of collapsing on itself. But we still want it to be torsionally free so that it can flex when we have a single wheel bump. And this is fundamentally what the twist beam suspension is. It's a one piece a sort of rear suspension assembly uh, that has the two left and right wheels coupled um, and relies on flexure within the assembly itself to cause your suspension compliance. And that creates a few different interesting characteristics. One of the, the most interesting ones is how it behaves in bump on a single wheel and how its camber curves behave. So we can see that if we now look from the rear of our car, so there's our wheels there, um, and then we'll draw our little twist beam suspension in here. If we were to bump up this wheel there, what happens is that this beam has some degree of rigidity and that's gonna cause the whole assembly to sort of try and pivot around that way. So what happens is that you get flexure in here, this causes this wheel to move somewhat in an arc like that. Uh, so you actually get a camber gain on that wheel as it goes up into a single bump. And what this means is that if you imagine the car going along and you have a body roll motion or something like that, the deflection does mean that the car has some degree of camber gain on the rear suspension, which is a, a desirable trait. Um, however, if we put both wheels in bump, uh, what happens is the whole assembly uh, won't have any differential twist uh, between the two wheels, so the whole assembly will just move up together rigidly, and because of this alignment here, you'll actually end up with no camber gain on the wheels. They'll both just bump up together uh, with no camber gain, which is also pretty good because when you're in a straight line, you don't need any camber. Um, so if we just imagine a case of straight braking or something like that, you won't get any camber changes there. Um, so that's the basic camber characteristic of this setup. Uh, what's also a curious part of the setup is the toe characteristics. Uh, so if we were to apply a lateral force, like say I've applied over on this side, uh, you can see that there's a certain degree of bending in this section here because we've got it supported here and free here. So what happens is that this will deflect in that way whilst being effectively rigidly held there uh, 
which causes this tire to effectively be angled outwards. Uh, now what that means is that as your lateral force increases on that axle, uh, you get toe out on the wheel. Uh, toe out causes your effective slip angle to increase, so you can think of it as, as the lateral force increases, this causes oversteer on that axle. And on many front wheel drive cars, this may in fact be a beneficial thing uh, because you are trying to mitigate some of the inherent understeer present in the setup. Uh, it's not always ideal, uh, but it is just an interesting characteristic of this suspension. Due to the large offset from the wheel center line to where the trailing arm meets up with the torsion bar, you can end up with a pretty significant moment there which can cause a large deflection. So in bump, what will happen is that any vertical load will cause an increase in the negative camber, the, the top of the wheel will move inboard, and when you're hitting the brakes, the wheel will try to deflect uh, inboard as well and tow out. You also have to factor in how the deformation in the bush affects the axle, and you can compensate for this by angling the bushes out to then try and reduce the deformation under different lateral loadings. So now that we've discussed the basics of how the suspension works, why don't we get into some of the advantages and disadvantages of it? The primary advantage of this system, and the reason why most manufacturers end up using it, is because it's very cheap to make. When you look at it, you can see this whole piece here is all going to be just one piece. Uh, so you make it in one piece and you bolt it up, and I've seen numbers quoted for this for anywhere between 50 to 100 euro per car saved, which doesn't sound like much, but you know, a savings is a saving. Um, the other thing is that on the final assembly line, it's less parts to put together than a multi-link or a double A arm or something like that suspension, because um, it's just one bit. You bolt up, it's got two attachment points on the chassis, then you have to attach a, um, a spring here and a damper here, and that's basically your suspension done. The other thing is you can make it have a lot of cabin space in that rear end because it's quite a compact setup in terms of flatness. You don't need to have, uh, for example, on something like a multi-link suspension setup, you've got to have uh, pickup points at different points for the uprights. Um, so you'll have pickup points on the chassis, you'll have a subframe in here. So we can see that that is going to take up a lot more space. So we can see that it's quite a compact setup that we've got going on there. Again, on the part number reduction, um, you can see that this whole bit here, because it's acting like an anti-roll bar, it means that we don't actually need an anti-roll bar if our car was to require one because it's inherently got roll stiffness within that suspension. Uh, so because we don't need that anti-roll bar, that's again one less part we need for the car. We also only have two bushings to take care of there and there, so presumably it's much easier at maintenance time. Another advantage is that with where we can mount our springs and dampers, we can actually put our spring and damper quite far out uh, because of how the packaging works. And this means that we can have spring and damper motion ratios that are roughly approaching one to one. Whereas if something like a multi-link, you have to have an arm coming out to your upright um, and then you have to have a spring going on the arm. So that's the chassis pivot there, that's the upright, here's your wheel here. Um, and so the spring is on the arm, so the spring will be at some motion ratio, say 0 0.7 to one, uh, which means that you've got to use a spring that's 30% stiffer than it would need to be if you just attach directly to the upright. Uh, so you can see that from that you can run lighter and cheaper springs and dampers because they don't have to deal with as much force. Of course, many real world setups do in fact run their, their springs and dampers further back along the arm, uh, but uh, it's just a possibility that you can in fact get that one-to-one -one motion ratio without too much effort. There is also an advantage, of, a very specific advantage for certain types of uh, race cars where you can have a really large diffuser exit volume for something like a time attack car because you can see this massive gap that's formed up here um, and so you can end up with a really large void that you can start your diffuser kick line early on while still retaining a relatively stock suspension. So what are the disadvantages of this suspension setup? Well, like I mentioned before, there's a few interesting handling quirks in terms of that sort of oversteer toe characteristic. Um, you do also have inherent coupling effects between the two wheels, um, and to some extent, uh, you, while you can use clever uh, torsion beam design to get around this, but your, your roll stiffness is always going to have some degree of an effect onto your camber curve. With that toe compliance I was talking about over, earlier and its oversteer characteristic, you can solve this by adding a, a, a type of linkage in the center um, where you basically have a, a frame a pivot out in this location here, and then you'll run a, um, a bar from there to there. Um, I believe it's called a Watts linkage. Uh, 
and basically you, you can run the bar and it means that as that compressive force moves in there, uh, it's resisted by this bar linkage. Another disadvantage of this system uh, is the fact that you've got quite a large diameter bar through here to, to provide that roll stiffness and to provide the strength in the setup. Um, and that actually means that the, the strain within the bar under the flexure um, of roll loadings can be quite high. And the problem with that is, is that you need to spend a lot of R&D time uh, getting that sorted and all the welds sorted there so that you don't have fatigue issues in that area. Being a fixed bar, this also means that you have no real way of adjusting your alignment. Like if you want to change your toe here, um, the only way to do it would be if you had a sort of pivoting stub axle because this whole setup here is all rigid. Um, and because it's rigid, uh, if you want to adjust toe, can't really be done. Um, so you're kind of fixed with the alignment you get. And it's the same sort of thing for in camber as well. So that's a bit of a disadvantage to this setup, particularly if you wanted to to run on something like a track car where you want to be able to play around with the alignment very quickly. While we're on the subject of that adjustability, uh, we also should talk a little bit about how we tune the roll stiffness in the car because it kind of limits our options. We can add additional roll stiffness by adding a bolt-on roll bar. Um, there are some kits for this that just bolt on underneath and they will increase the roll stiffness. So if you have an understeery car and you need to increase your rear roll stiffness, um, you can increase that with the bolt-on bar. Um, the other option is you can have an external uh, anti-roll bar or sway bar, much like a regular car, just with linkages and stuff like that. But the problem is there's no real way to decrease our, um, our roll resistance uh, without uh, basically cutting holes in the beam. But you'd have to be pretty keen to try something like that. And then, of course, we run to the fact that this whole system uh, doesn't have any damping uh, in roll. Um, which, like many car setups, but you're going to always compromise your ride quality and your mechanical grip to an extent by having a setup like that. Well, thanks for watching. Uh, let me know if you like this new style of video um, and if it's something that works for you guys, I'll consider doing this instead of whiteboard videos in the future. Uh, if you like this video, uh, hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you next time.